So this talk is called Navigating the Intersection of Open Source Security and AI. My name is Harry. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Open Source Security Foundation, or OpenSSF. I've been here for about a year. My background's in um, consulting, uh, so about 11 years doing that for US government, um, our allied partners, state and local, financial services, healthcare, aerospace defense kind of companies. Um, everything around AI, cyber, data, and AI or IT. Um, the mission of OpenSSF, if you don't know what we do, uh, we sust sustainably secure open source software. That We were founded in 2020 um, after uh, some of the incidents that occurred back then, uh, like Log4j, and uh, the industry came together to create this foundation uh, so we could foster tools um, that are both secure, secure tools themselves, uh, but also uh, tools that help secure open source software uh, generally. We believe open source software is a digital public good, and that's why securing it is uh, paramount. Um, this is a bit of our strategy. These things are on our website as well. Um, so what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then in terms of how we look at security um, in, in, in this, uh, uh, both from developing software as well as supply chain security. So, it's, we do take kind of a holistic approach uh, when we're, we're looking at um, security and not just focused on one or the other. Um, and we have working groups and all sorts of things to reflect uh, this, uh, this approach. For this talk, I wanted to talk about the end, right? What if someone downloaded at some point the wrong PyTorch package? What if that PyTorch package had a backdoor in it? What if that backdoor let an actor uh, change how a model worked. But that change wasn't very evident to the user of that, of that model. Um, that model was used to research new proteins. Uh, and then it found a fantastic protein that could change all of, all of life, right? But just a little bit inside that protein was bad, was bad for humanity. And then everyone died. That wouldn't be great if open source software led to the end of humanity, but it could. We don't really know what's on the horizon. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of blame to go around in the open source community. Um, so yes, finally, Mastodon might be silent. Um, but looking at this, uh, what, what does this uh, roundabout um, look like, right? So open source software is used in AI systems. AI systems themselves can be open sourced. Once those AI systems are established. They can also be used to find and fix open source um, vulnerabilities. Um, and then, of course, AI themselves can be developers um, and producing open source software. It's, it's a vicious supply chain. And each one of these areas brings about a new attack vector, uh, something different, something we haven't seen before. So the security of OSS packages in AI is fairly critical, as it is critical in every single scenario, right? But it's even more interesting in AI, just because of the complexity of things that can occur. Then looking at uh, AI itself, AI can be open sourced across a range of modalities. Maybe it's the model, maybe it's the algorithm, maybe it's the training data, maybe it's the weights. There's so many different ways an AI system, uh, quote unquote, could be open sourced. We don't necessarily know all the threats to each one of those, um, especially when it comes from an open source perspective. Then you're looking at finding and fixing vulnerabilities. Well, we're actually um, advisors to a challenge that DARPA is putting together, or has put together, called the AI Cyber Challenge. And that one looks at leveraging large language models to find and fix vulnerabilities in open source software. Now. One of the things that we early on advised them is that that sort of find and fix mentality could lead to uh, overwhelming uh, open source uh, uh, repos with tons of fixes just because an uh, AI system thought it was a good idea, uh, thought it was solving an issue. Well, that could end up spamming a repo, which in itself could be a vulnerability. Then looking at AI developers. Uh, AI within a development lifecycle could help augment human developers, but it could also produce code, as we are all well aware. 
And doing that systematically, what sort of standards should that AI developer be following from a security perspective? Of course, those standards are written, but those standards are human readable at this point. There's not many machine readable standards for security. Looking at the basics, I often get asked, I was doing this presentation at the University of Texas Austin at the Machine uh, Learning Lab, now their Center for Generative AI, about what could, what could you do to uh, secure uh, your, a your AI environment, so to speak. There are three kind of things that you could do, and they're all very basic, from education, best practices, and trust, trustworthiness. First, take secure software development training. Uh, we have plenty of guides at OpenSSF as well. Uh, and there's a course uh, called, uh, I think the course number is LFD 121, um, and it's secure software development um, course. And it's a free course, anybody can take. Um, and so that's one thing on the education side. Not all software developers out of university have taken a security course. And so it's really important that when you're entering the workforce, that you think about how you're um, developing code securely within commercial enterprises, right? So whether you're a manager or a software developer, these things can come to practice. Speaking of practice, one of the basic things you can do is uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, start using that in your development environment. But also Salsa. Uh, Salsa is something that producers can use to um, put together or, or implement a set of best practices, supply chain levels for software security or software artifacts. Um, and that helps institute a level of provenance when you're developing software artifacts. And uh, the other part, on trust. Stop talking to strangers on the internet. Um, that's very much true in the sense of hugging face, um, but that's one of the things that you could do, of course. The other thing is trust what you're downloading. So if, if you implement SigStore as a producer, you can actually promote that trust to consumers who can then verify that the software artifact that they're getting um, is signed, which is what SigStore does, sign software artifacts. So the problem, looking at it from a end-to-end, -end, um, OSS is used to make AI work. We all know that. Everyone who's developed AI or developed uh, an AI system or any components of an AI system has used open source software. That software can be backdoored. We know that. AI is also open sourced. We know that uh, data poisoning is a, a serious issue, right? I'm not here to address data poisoning itself, but simply to point out that open source software can introduce data poisoning um, beyond some of the normal uh, threat vectors that we've seen. And then LLMs can be used to secure OSS, but it can also be used to spam OSS. And then of course, AI can build open source software, but it can build it wrong. It can build it from its perspective, but not from a human perspective, not even from a consumer's perspective. So the approach, as I stated before, know what you're downloading. Sign your models. Models are just software. So we have the capability to sign software artifacts, treat components of your AI systems as software artifacts and sign them. Um, and then participate in some of these more innovative challenges. If you're a startup, um, the AI cyber challenge that DARPA is putting on, which I mentioned earlier, um, can be used to um, you know, figure out whether what you're doing is right from an AI for security perspective. Um, is useful, and you could be awarded money for that. So it is, um, I think it's $18 million across a variety, a couple of years, and a variety of winning positions. Um, you'd get some money out of that. And then more so on the AI for OSS, building OSS, um, this is more of a conversation piece, right? For us, we don't know what the right answer is. So we're looking for the community to provide uh, a set of standards, a set of specifications that we can, we can promote to build software securely when it comes to AI in the dev cycle. So some of the tools that um, are out there today that you can implement to help 
elevate the security of your um, uh, of this um, end to end from secure ingestion, you can set up a program. So I don't know how many of you, where you all work in terms of um, organization, but if you're part of an enterprise, you're ingesting uh, open source software as it is, right? You might do it from a monorepo standpoint, you might do it from an individual team standpoint. So some companies have implemented um, S2C2F. Um, I can never, f for the life of me, remember what all the S's and C's stand for. But it's an OpenSSF project that helps you programmatically uh, assess the security of open source software. And so there's a set of recommendations, how you look at open source software, and you can modify that based on um, the threat model that you're working with. So setting up secure ingest, right? Also looking at the open source software that you're ingesting, leveraging OpenSSF scorecard. There's other tools out there as well um, that help you give a quantitative score as well as qualitative metrics to evaluate when you're looking at open source software um, that you want to bring in. Um, looking at secure development, there's also, as I mentioned, Salsa. There's also different levels. Level one is, is quite basic level, but level three is what you really want to attain if you're producing software um, for, for, for uh, commercial consumption. And then secure standards. There's not many for AI. Um, NIST has come up with some, or, or is developing some, but Google's SAFE framework uh, is pretty useful, a pretty good start, um, and so you can uh, definitely go to Google's site and see that. And then secure consumption. So the particular slide doesn't differentiate between producers and consumers, so in this particular case, SIG store is something producers can do uh, to, to implement. Um, I mentioned earlier on signing models, but you can sign other aspects of your software artifact as well. And then you can provide that secure, uh, that, that SIG store, that sign, to consumers to verify that what they're downloading is what you signed. And truth be told, this is all a risk management approach, right? Because if you're the one who's consuming any of this, and it does come back around, you can, do, you can make the trade-off, right? Am I going to ingest a signed model, or am I going to ingest some random model? Perhaps all models are random to some degree. So the community. Uh, we have an AI security working group. Some of the things that they're working on uh, is listed there, model signing specification, uh, AI vulnerability disclosure guidance, benchmarking OSS security in AI. Should there be a higher bar for open source software um, for the security of open source software in AI systems. Um, how do you evaluate that? Uh, because what we do now, for example, with the OpenSSF scorecard is provide a standard way of evaluating um, a million repos. I think they look at a million repos every other week. Should we do something a little bit more nuanced for AI systems? So that's something they're discussing. AI security re regulation mapping, um, as well as um, tooling for secure AI systems. Uh, a little bit on the AI, um, AIXCC, the AI Cyber Challenge. Uh, they'll be uh, doing a uh, qualification round uh, here, which does come with uh, award prizes. Um, so if you've signed up, um, great. There's also an open track session. Um, so that's happening at DEF CON uh, in about a month's time, a little bit more than six weeks. Um, and then this is just an overview of OpenSSF's technical initiatives overall. So with that, what I really wanted to do with this presentation is to have much, a lot of time for Q&A, but also to really spark any ideas, because it takes one person <laughs> to be a maintainer, as we all know, but to come up with ideas to talk about concerns, uh, opportunities, um, because that is, th this area of open source security and particularly AI is rather new when it comes to the security lens. Of course, open source software has been used in AI systems for decades. Um, but in terms of the security, we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing the security issues balloon, right? So we need sustainable ways to address that. And that is the end of my, there's, there's more slides on 
these are some of the companies that work with OpenSSF um, at the moment uh, in the different groups, and uh, here's some of the projects that we have as well. Um, so one thing that we're trying to do is promote a, or not promote, but build a um, architectural view of what um, some of these, how these projects align to um, AI, the security for AI systems. So nothing set in stone, but we need your help to do that. So that's the end. That's the end of the, my presentation, but I'm happy to take your questions if there are any. Yes. I don't know about that, but our Slack community is quite um, awake, if you'd like to ask them, <laughs> ask them that. Um, I do know several, there are several things ongoing about internalizing that, um, and I would say that some of it has gone forward in the last year, but off the top of my head, I couldn't give you a single example. Are there questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, the best practices badge um, is uh, something that uh, a repo, a maintainer, a contributor can go in and um, self-attest to uh, various criteria in the badge and then apply that to their uh, GitHub um, uh, repo. Well, the badge is self-attesting, so you would you would go through and you would mark what what has been accomplished um, in that. No. Scorecard is the automated uh, run uh, that looks at the re repo and the security features of the repo. The best practices badge. There's two different badges, essentially. Other questions? Comments? Is there anybody here that's working on an AI security project that addresses OSS security or looks at that? Anybody interested in that? What do you, yeah, what is? Good. Also glad I'm just meant not interested. That's great to hear. Um, for the, um, speaking of, kind of salsa um, when you're a producer, right? And um, attesting to that, we're looking at putting together a certification program to say that like, yes, I, this, was, this product was built in a salsa certified environment, something like that. Hopefully that can allow consumers to trust some product over another compare, when, when they're making those kind of trade-offs um, from a business standpoint and security standpoint. Um, but from the producer or from the maintainer side of the house or who's who, right? Um, there are certain um, initiatives underway to, I know MITRE has this phrase system of trust. Um, I don't know if it's plural, but I like to say there are these, we, we have to come up with a way to have a systems of trust, right? It's this trust that someone has produced something in a salsa certified environment or choose whichever you know, environment you wanna, you wanna call um, secure. Right, but somehow having these evolving systems of trust as well over time, I think we have to come with up with some specification, some way to highlight this um, as a kind of sustainable practice. Right, like I downloaded this, downloaded this software from this repo because this maintainer is in this particular trust circle. Right, this product was developed in this particular trust circle. Like. You know, there, there, um, there has to be a way to produce this for the consumers at the end of the day. I was talking with some folks at CISA um, yesterday, which is a cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. Um, and uh, we talked about how uh, the metric system was all based off like essentially a rock in a cave, right? Like how did we as humans ever trust that whoever's measuring that rock was doing it correctly, right? So there was a trust system there. Um, our, our, found, or our, um, our executive director at the Linux Foundation 
uh, talks about um, cryptographic signing uh, parties uh, or key signing parties, uh, which is things that still happen. Um, but that involves a bunch of people coming together who then see each other, right, and have some sort of level of trust based over, over time, seeing each other with such frequency and knowing who's doing what in terms of contributions. Um, that's obviously kind of difficult with AI, um, especially how quickly it happens, uh, could happen. So all thoughts um, in terms of what has been done, but I hear a lot about what shouldn't be done in the future. And I always come to the fact that, um, well, as humanity, we've, we have solved for these issues, similar issues in the past. So I think we can solve for them in the future. Um, and probably somebody can make money off that as well. All right, any other, I'm just soapboxing at this point. Any other comments, questions? Is there a happy hour after this? Booth crawl, anybody? No? I didn't check the schedule. All right, awesome. Um, if there's no other comments, questions, I think I took 20 minutes. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for coming by. All right. <laughs>